By the December 2016, exactly before the Shadow Tactics was released, Mimimi Studio was actually bankrupt, and the only salvation for them was the successful sales at the start. They ran out of money, few employees were already fired, core team was forced to went all in. So let's see where this risky bet has led to. And if you're ready, we will begin. Just stay in shadows and beware of patrols. What actually is an iconic video game? It is a project that would be played by generations of players, but also it can be the bright representative of entirely forgotten but astonishing genre. Many of those who now rise in kids still remember the real-time tactics such as Commandos or Desperados. These games were so addictive due to their diverse and hardcore tactical gameplay, where a small group of saboteurs have to confront entire armies sneaking into impenetrable fortresses. As time went on, new projects significantly deviated from the traditions of this genre. Their boundaries blurred and finally this kind of games was completely forgotten. But after a decade and a half at the end of 2016, the real Christmas miracle happened. And today I want to talk about the Shadow Tactics phenomenon of the revival of iconic genre. The fact that the project succeeded is indicated by the Steam ratings. There are more than 24,000 reviews, 96% of which are positive. Both players and critics praise project at the Metacritic. And even if Shadow Tactics didn't break sales charts back then, it was a commercial success for the studio that allowed them to stay in business. But let's try to find out together what game design solutions and techniques were implemented in this masterpiece. And we will start with the choice of setting. The core idea of real-time tactics genre strongly relies on this setting. The very essence of such games is that our squad has to constantly face the tactical challenges that we might overcome only using the joint efforts of characters combining their abilities. All this in terms of the overwhelming dominance of enemy forces. Here you are the group of saboteurs behind enemy lines, and this role is best suited for the Japanese assassins, the ninjas. Edo period in medieval Japan is a very tempting choice for the game's setting. First, it is the romanticized images of silent mercenaries who have a whole arsenal of deadly weapons fitting perfectly for that kind of gameplay. Second, is an internecine wars peculiar to this historical period. That fills the plot with the meaningful conflicts and twists. Third, is the Japanese culture phenomenon with a remarkable and memorable art style. Painting, poetry, architecture, fashion – all this gives us colorful scene setups. And finally, it is the people in your values inherent to the heroes of those years. Courage, honor and self-sacrifice. All those aspects helps to create the perfect atmosphere for this adventure. But it is not that simple as it seems. You need to do a lot of work to convey and emphasize this kind of setting. For the German devs, who are not specialized in Japanese culture, this was a real challenge. And I am not an adept of a Japanese culture also, but it seems that they managed to get the right spirit of this era. Moreover, for the world outside Japan, such projects also have a significant value, because they indirectly affect the perception of the cultural features and values of this proud nation. From the game design point of view, this means that it is necessary not only to invest a huge amount of resources, but also to maintain the perfect balance between reality and fiction to enhance core gameplay design with this. So let's look how this approach affects each element of the game. Let's jump right to our characters. We got five-man group, and in the best traditions of the genre, our protagonists are all different. To emphasize this feature, developers used a little trick. Just check it out. A mercenary called Blooded Ninja, who is driven by his greed. Orphan girl, who learned to survive alone in the cruel world. Old man, a cripple, but unexperienced gunsmith and sharpshooter. An old noble samurai, unquestionably loyal to his shogun. And finally, the master of disguise and espionage. And we even haven't talked about the mechanics yet. But the approach is clear. The goal was to create the most contrasting roster that can perform real magic working as a team. This feature has two objectives. 
First is to create the memorable images of characters that arose the empathy. And second is to convince the player that despite the difficulty of the challenges, such a squad is able to do the impossible. So if you take a look at the visual component, the influence of the setting can be seen in many details. And the basics of the art style is a color palette that are perfectly matched for both particular mission landscape and general art direction. Color combinations make this episode diverse and memorable. Also, one small but fascinating visual feature that you can see here is clear black outlines of the game objects. This technique helps to solve the issue of legibility of a relatively small objects on the scene, which is crucial for isometric perspective-based genres. Devs managed to find an elegant and simple solution. In general, the visual elements strongly emphasize the style of Edo-era Japan which was a real challenge, as a team do not have many artists and designers at their disposal. Interface elements also got some original solutions. First mentioned earlier technique of highlighted interactive objects, significantly simplified gameplay interaction. Player must be aware of any possible interaction with the game world. Or at least you should provide him with the clear instructions how, and most importantly what for he can use these possibilities. Second UI element is the quick save timer, which reminds the player to save progress occasionally. It may seem that this system interferes with the gameplay, but in fact it is an integral part of it, which is why devs have made it as convenient as possible. And finally, all interface elements complement to art style, and you can notice here nice stylistic solutions that refer to the setting. And to enhance this impression with music, I like you to enjoy this menu theme. It is just a masterpiece, but here is more, the loading screen with calm melody that combines ethnic instruments with the sounds of bottle drums, it is just the audio perfection. The ambient music itself is also very refined, and here is why, devs made 15 layered tracks which dynamically changes in relation to gameplay situation, adding tension or subside at the right moments. This system almost imperceptibly interacting with subconsciousness, providing right musical accompaniment. It persistently follows players' actions. You won't add it to your playlist though, but it can handle the tasks of immersing player in the gameplay process, just like the sound effects themselves. As for the voice acting performed in English and Japanese, all works well. But I'm afraid that devs took a lot of risks here. I endorse the desire to use Japanese voiceover, but it seems to me that it could spoil the immersion of the game for the Japanese-speaking audience. At least intonation seems a bit unnatural, but for others it sounds pretty much authentic. The English voices are perfectly fit though, allowing to create memorable images. Yuki and Takuma-san are especially good. And this is crucial feature because the characters here are much more important to overall experience than the storyline itself. Speaking of which, the main test of a narrative is to reveal the characters and establish the harmonious connection between missions in a single plot sequence. Here you can see a curious trick that was used. The image of the Shogun, to whom our squad serves, allows devs to throw our squad from the one region to another. They are his secret weapon, which he used point by point for covered operations. All other details of the storyline is mostly generic. Yes, there are a couple of twists and emotional moments, but still. All within the framework of a decent story. As for the core gameplay mechanics, at first glance it seems that all character skill sets are radically different. But this is not quite true. Actually, they can be combined into groups of skills. For example, each character has tools for distracting enemies, and these tools might work differently so using conditions may depend. But the fact is that there is no perfectly suitable skill or character for any game challenge. This provokes an experimentation. Second group of skills is the melee techniques. Yuki has her knife, Mugen got katana, Aiko poisoned needle, Hayato uses ninjato and only the old man Takuma cannot fight in melee. Thus, the player can use various character setups in most gameplay situations. But there are mechanics that are unique to our protagonists, their special abilities. 
the ones that distinguish them the most in terms of both gameplay and narrative purposes. I mean, there are a lot of situations in which particular character thrives with his special ability, but this is more like subjective feeling rather than obligatory condition. Also, some cheats were used in this skill system. Each character has firearm with limited ammunition. This is how devs elegantly solved the problem of player getting stuck on a certain segment of the level. A kind of limited overpowered ability for those who are desperate to find the solution. It is brilliant. And now let's consider all the abilities of the characters in synergy. And it will become obvious that this system of skills creates an infinite number of options for their joint use. It's like a sandbox. You have the shovel, a bucket and a couple of malts, but you can make everything that you can imagine. And the base for this are provided by the level design. So let's talk about it in details. I'll be honest with you, level design of the real-time tactics has always amazed me. It is fascinating how each level puts in front of you more and more combat puzzles that can have several solutions. It all depends on sharpness of your mind to plan and skill to execute. But the execution phase contains a lot of challenges as well. You need to react quickly and coordinate the actions of your squad masterfully. But what is the level design mastery? For me, there is still some mystery in its essence, and I will explain why. I don't know the details of the level creation process that Mimimi Studio used here, but there are a few basic principles for building such complex levels. First is a backbone of the level, the first step to grey box prototype. The relief map with a bunch of possible playthrough paths which can have multiple points of intersection in order to create the playthrough variability. Second, all the objectives and general architecture are pinned on the map, main and optional goals, starting points, landmarks and buildings setting up. And notice that there is a significant amount of missions where our characters are spread out all over the map. Thus, devs also can tune up perceptible level complexity. After all these parameters are built, the process of initial road placement of enemies begins. Patrol routes, guard positions and their view cone motion parameters are determined. Here you need to create the system in which the view cones of the guards will dynamically intersect, creating a unique puzzle for each situation in a specific time frame. There is a certain design technique for this. I may oversimplify, but here is one. Place the first guard in accordance with his purpose, for example protecting the gate through which players can enter the estate. Then determine the area in which this guard operates, static position or patrol. After we place more guards so they can track the position of the first one. The so-called first circle of observation. Then comes second and third circle, intersecting first one on a different angles, and so forth. Depending on the length of this chain, numbers and types of guards, additional observation circles may be created for this setup. For example, the sniper on a hill. After, we need to tune all these setups, which means a lot of play testing. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So now time has come for interactive objects placement. Bushes, ladders, hooks, etc. And our basic level design is now ready. Usually, this process runs on technical prototyping phase, with a minimal effort spent on a visual decor and art. This approach that I described above is not a dogma and may differ from team to team, but it provides basic understanding. So we created a grey box prototype, and now we need playtests to create an exciting gameplay. That's where the magic happens. This is the most crucial development phase that can substantially change all that we made before. The success of the entire game often depends on the quality of playtests, and I don't know how to stress this more. Now we need to carry several iterations of playtests, we need to polish our levels, and what is the result? In most cases, we get a game mission that is fun to play through, but in one way. Players often will use a particular character, combination of certain skills or a specific route that seems easier to went through. This is why we need even more playtests, to use the opportunity to balance the level itself and all its areas. Player often follows the shortest or easiest path to success. This is how our mind works. But this obvious path can reduce the experimentation desire. This is a hard one, because gameplay experience have too many characteristics and depends on aesthetics, challenges, objectives, narratives and many other things based on which player chooses his playstyle. In many cases, this is simply impossible to analyze this on paper, 
and only playtests can help to balance all these elements. But game designers actually got some tools and tricks for such tasks. They can gently direct the player to choose certain ways to play through. One of the examples is using the hints through character voiceover to offer a solution, so devs can reach player directly. It is necessary to realize, though, that players actually don't need a complete gameplay freedom. It can paralyze them. But you need to give a sense of meaningful choice that leaves a feeling of complete control. As an example, take a look at characters' conversations, and you will notice it. This approach used by many game developers and proven to be efficient. A couple more fascinating features of the Shadow Tactics level design is the nighttime and snow-covered landscapes, which are forced player to adapt to new conditions like dim lights or footprints. These small techniques are intuitive to learn but dramatically changing the experience and provide more diversity to the gameplay. All of the above make the mission set of the project memorable. It is clear that a lot of work has to be done here, and these efforts were not in vain. Now let's move to the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, because it can explain the purpose of creating such complex levels. It based on the following sequence. The solution of the small puzzle in most cases killing priorities, followed by the execution of these plans, which uncovers all the flaws in the original plan. After you modify an initial plan, and so on till it will bring a desired outcome. This sequences allows to balance tactical thinking with the pure mechanics of execution. It gives player a break from both solving and performing activities. It is the essence for which many players love this genre. But it is obvious that this kind of gameplay requires a lot of attempts and iterations. This issue can be solved in several ways, for example, the traditional quick-save load system. And it seems trivial only at first glance. In this project, it is tuned so elegantly. The countdown timer from the last save moment reminds the player to save progress. Also, there are three slots of quick saving, not one as we used to. So that if the player makes a crucial mistake and overwrite his last quick save, he could roll back to the previous points. And finally, the technical implementation of the system is also remarkable. Developers have made a huge amount of effort to reduce the time of saving and loading game state. All this led to main objective – minimal distraction from the actual gameplay. Now let's take a break and discuss the tedious part of any development process – cross-platform adaptation. Here I would like to consider the differences between the PC and console versions. First time I played Shadow Tactics on PS4, where you control characters directly. It was easy to immerse myself in a particular character role. This is a great in terms of the gaming experience. You are waiting for opportunity to switch to your favorite character and throw him into action. Although the PC version gives the completely different experience. You don't control the characters directly, instead you give them an orders. Here you feel like a commander managing the squad. And this gives you one advantage. It is way easier to coordinate the simultaneous actions in real time. All these differences between platforms might violate the immersion, but both game versions can give a fantastic experience, and it is hard to say which one is better. Both versions got one groundbreaking gameplay management mechanic. The Shadow Plan mode. It allows you to stop the time and plan the sequence of actions for each character, and on command they will start performing these actions in parallel. This mode is a great finding for game designers. It distinguishes Shadow Tactics from many similar projects. Moreover, it serves in a demand of the gameplay, since there is a lot of situations that can only be solved by combining the actions of various characters at once. And of course, it creates the wow effect. This one feature solves two major problems. It adapted the ability to control multiple characters and created a tool for staging and epic scenes, like you are the movie director. Bravo! And like the player, devs also want to act as a director for entire gaming experience although they do it as unobtrusively as possible. Let me show what I'm talking about. Note how the setup of our team vary from one mission to another, how carefully devs manage to take away one and introduce another character. All this is done for a good intentions. First, to diversify gameplay, obviously, and second, to stimulate the player in mastering all the features and possible combination of various setups. This technique along the way helps true narration to reveal all real traits and motivation of our protagonists. Shadow Tactics game design in general behind this complex combination of game systems 
hide one terrific secret. There are elements which are implemented much more simplistically than we are used to seeing in modern games. For instance, there are only three types of enemies in entire game. Only three. Or artificial intelligence. All the enemies are pretty dull. Their behavior is absolutely predictable. But these are not the disadvantages as you might think. These systems are deliberately simplified, because they make the gameplay consistent, add more depth or variation to the systems and the gameplay balance will collapse. As a player, when you plan the action sequences, you must clearly understand the enemy response scenarios, and you should be able to predict the outcome, otherwise the meaning of planning process will fade. So the secret of Shadow Tactics lays in courage of the developers to refrain from the temptation to create more and more complex systems because the particular ones can meet the needs of the core gameplay perfectly. This is a crucial point. For now, we talk a lot about Shadow Tactics Pros, so what about cons? Well, some players complained about control binding schemes, and I would rather agree with them. Both the PC and console versions force you to get used to it for some time. Devs themselves admit that. Players also argue a lot about the difficulty balance, with radically different statements. Some say that it's too challenging, for others game is too easy like a walk through the morning meadow. Actually, it is not about the difficulty balance. This game made for a certain type of players. Like niche games or even whole genres, Shadow Tactics has its specific kind of players. Many projects try to be open to wider audience and lose their spirit in this path. Don't try to please everyone. Be honest to yourself and you will have the loyal community that is not afraid of challenges. That being said, the system of achievements deserve a few words also. Here you are not just rewarded for any baby-like simple action that spoils the most of the projects nowadays. Achievements put the player in front of a new gameplay challenges, sometimes very difficult. You can't just play through the game in ordinary way and get most of them. The goal was to increase the replayability and give the players well-deserved reward. Especially notable the speedrun challenges, which is actually represent a competitive category. For the particular player, all this is underpinned by a sweet sense of accomplishment. This is how achievement system should work. No pain, no gain. Well, we sort out all gameplay features. And now let's move to the technical part of the project. Shadow Tactics based on the Unity engine, which allowed team to optimize the development process, but many tools were created from scratch during development. First of all, for graphics and audio assets management were developed custom tools. The idea was to manage object libraries, customize their properties on the fly and control their versions. Actually, Mimimi had a detailed talk on the Unite Europe convention on this topic so you can learn technical details more deeply. Here I will only note one feature that fascinates me. At the later stage of development process they encountered problems with the game performance. On the PC it runs on 40 to 70 FPS, with the rare drawdowns to 30. On the consoles though, the FPS meter could drop to 15. And this was a disaster. In addition, it was necessary to optimize the performance of quick save load systems as much as possible. The loading time could reach 50 seconds on consoles, which was absolutely unacceptable. Devs have to make a titanic work and find ways to optimize both the code itself and the applications that use engine's capabilities to achieve acceptable outcome. A stable 60 FPS for PC and 30 for consoles and a quick load time within the 3 seconds frame. I pay attention to this because it is not always possible to take into account and evaluate the scope of work that needs to be done to optimize the performance of the game, especially in late development stages. Performance is an equally important key to success as the core gameplay or a graphics. We shouldn't forget about that. Finally, we're ready to sum this talk. The Mimimi team really amazed me in their bravery. The revival of a long forgotten but such a wonderful genre. Stunning setting carefully recreating the spirit of the Japanese Edo era, so well suited for this kind of gameplay. Characters striking both in gaming experience and emotional response. All these elements grant success to this particular project and provided a bright future for the studio. And I am glad that they are succeeded as Shadow Tactics has already followed by the brilliant sequel of Desperados and the DLC Ico's Choice that came up recently. But we want more such games. 
So I would like to thank you guys for watching this video. Share your thoughts about the game development art below and I will join you. And if you like this video, you know what to do. I'll see you soon. Bye.